I'm anxious for you to uh, turn with me again to 1 John chapter 4. And I'm anxious to get into this passage with you. We uh, began this passage in our last class session. And today we want to continue into this and go deeper and allow God to speak to us through His Word. Uh, 1 John chapter 4. It actually begins at verse 8 and it goes down through and includes verse 17. And we're looking uh, specifically at the love of God. You will notice also in your textbook that this is found. Uh, this lesson is found there with some uh, fill-in and, and a workbook to go with it. And you, it has a chart, and you will want to have that chart available because we, want to walk, we are walking through that chart as we uh, look at this study. Again, we're looking at uh, ways of expressing what this business of the being and doing is all about. Being is an internal state of the reality of the person of God actually making you that, uh, uh, what, that thing that he wants you to be. That characteristic, that attitude, uh, that person that he wants you to be. So that it isn't something you just do, it's actually who you are. And out of the uh, who you are comes this tremendous action which is authentic, which is real, it's spontaneous, it's automatic. In other words, instead of external pressing you and, and shaping you uh, in your personhood uh, 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 to the internal, there comes this internal which is flowing in its expression, which is literally expressing itself in the external. So this is not from external to the internal, this is from internal to the external. It's the state of being. It's the nature of God. It's literally being so possessed by Him that He literally possesses you. And in the possession of, his, of, his, of you by Him, He can literally begin to flow through you who He is. And who He is is so dynamic, it's creative in its quality. And begins to create through you these marvelous qualities and characteristics and attributes and, and, and flow of His person. And you become the demonstration of the reality of the person of Christ. Oh man, I want that. Woo! Boy, do I want that. That's the fullness of Jesus living within you. Now, we're looking specifically at the subject of love. Of course, this is back to who God is and what He is in His nature now being expressed through us. And again, in this class period, I want to take the time to read uh, this passage. The reason is because it's so dynamic just to sit and listen to the words, how he phrases them, how he puts them together, and the meaning of it, grasping the heart of the passage itself. If we didn't do anything but just listen to the words of this passage, this scripture, we would be doing well. 1 John chapter 4. It begins at verse 8. Listen to the word of God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. In this the love of God was manifested towards us, that God has sent His only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through Him. In this is love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us, and His love has been perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in Him, and He in us, because He has given us of His Spirit. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent the Son as Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in Him, and He in God. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love. And he who abides in love abides in God. And God in him. Love has been perfected among us in this. That we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so are we in this world. Now in our last class session, we tried thoroughly to understand and grasp the great idea of the bread quality of the sandwich. You'll remember the bread quality is that which holds it all together. So in verse 4 and in verse 16, 
he gives us the stabilizing force of this tremendous presentation. Everything that's in between verse 4 and verse 16 is going to be held together. It's going to make sense because of the statement of verse 4 and verse 16. It was your first memory verse. You came home from Sunday school so proud. What did you learn, son? You stood tall. You quoted, God is love. Hey, it's the beginning point. It's the starting point of everything. If you don't start there, you get all messed up. God is love. Is a verb of being. A state of being. Not that God does lovely things. Not that God does lovely deeds. But that God is love. Not that on certain occasions God expresses uh, activities of love. But that God in his internal nature, in his mind, the way he sees things, the flow of his life, who he is, the quality of his very being, it's absolutely impossible for God to do anything but love. Because it's just who he is. It spontaneously rolls through his system. It's the way he thinks. It's the nature of his being. God is love. Oh, we must grasp it. In fact, it must grasp us. The very person of God and the only possibility I have of doing and being is, is in this nature of God. I must be filled with the nature of God himself. For he alone, he alone can make me be love as he is. I may bite my lip and do lovely things, but I'll never be love until I'm possessed with the one who is love. I may bite my lip and express uh, lovely deeds in terms of uh, aggressive activities. I, I, I may accomplish things that would cause people to sense that I care for them. But when it comes right down to it, I may do charitable deeds. I may give, I may feed the poor. But if I don't have this internal, I may speak with the with the words of angels, I, I may proclaim, I may give my life in, in service, but if I do not have this essence of love, the nature of the, of the being of God, I am nothing. I have no love. I am simply a state of doing rather than of being. I want to be the love of God to my world. That's what he's sharing with us. Now that's the bread quality. Everything hangs on that. I trust that I trust that you have grasped that. Now he says, let's move to the actual ingredients that make up this sandwich. And as you move to the ingredients, the first one he gives to us is found in verse 9 and 10. We're putting those together. Here's what he says. In this, the love of God was manifested towards us. That God has sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Did you get the action words? Huh. God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent. This first ingredient is called the action of God's love. God's love acted. In other words, the kind of love we're talking about is not a do-nothing kind of love. See, it's absolutely impossible for God to sit idly by and just have all these lovely feelings and hey, have this nature of love and God is love and he just lives in the glow of lovey, lovey, lovey. And that, that's, not, it's, that's impossible because this love, the love we're talking about, is so powerful and so overwhelming, it reached down inside of God, grabbed a hold of him and said, you can't just sit here and stew in your own juices. You've got to move on this thing. God, you've got to get out there and do this something about this. You've got to move on this. So so do nothingism is not an option for this kind of being. So wherever, why we get so confused about this, I cannot quite understand, except we've been so filled with our own selves and filled with our own laziness that we impose it upon God and everybody who gets in contact with him. What's going on here is not a do nothingism, is not 
a viable choice. It isn't the way, it just can't be that way. That is not possible. For the dynamic of the love of God, who He is in His nature, who He is in His very being, the makeup of His personality, will not allow Him to sit idly by. He has to roll up His sleeves. There has to be action to this. It has to flow out. He had to move out in redemption. God couldn't sit in His sky and get tickles up and down His spine and say, Oh, I feel good about you out there. Go and be fed. God had to move out. He had to die on a cross. There was no other choice. Where did it, where did it come from? It came from the very essence of the nature of God. Who He is within Himself. And who He is within Himself would not tolerate a do-nothing-ism. So if I ever become filled with God, I don't need to worry about, well, I'll just never do anything, just hang around and be. Well, that's not possible. That's absolutely impossible. Now, the other possibility is that you might develop a whole lot of activities of doing certain things, of doing activities of love, but they will never sense from you the very love of God from your doing until you've literally been possessed by the God who is love, which will spill out in this aggressive action of redemption. Oh, we've built fantastic churches. We've built large buildings. We've paved our parking lot. We've done all kinds of things. We've accumulated masses of people underneath one, run, one roof and thought we'd done something great. But the bottom line was, it was all about us. How many we had. What my ministry produces. How I feel. What makes me look good. How I am. What gives me the financial backing so I can live like I want to. We've done all of those kind of things, but to be filled with the love of God, which doesn't have an ulterior motive, that doesn't just do lovely deeds, but is actually filled with aggressive love that spills its out itself out in redemption. In fact, as you get into the scriptures, Jesus begins to use um, this examples, descriptions of this kind of love. In fact, the only way you can possibly, you can possibly love an individual that you can't get anything back from is to be filled with Jesus. That's the test. See, the test of Christianity is how do you treat those people that you can't get anything out of, that can't contribute back to you, that can't help you, that don't add anything to you? See, it's easy to, oh, I love you, you're a plumber, you can fix my plumbing. Oh, I love you, you're an electrician, you can help me with my electric electrical problems. See, I love you because you're a number on a board. I love you because you contribute here. But what about those people? What about those people that you can't get anything? They don't have anything that will help you. How do you feel about them? The only way you can love them is to be filled with the God who is love because that's the way he is. And his love, oh, we couldn't contribute to him. We had nothing to give to him. And yet, while we were yet in our sins, Christ died for us. Jesus was sent. God's love acted in our behalf. And the activity of God's love is Jesus. Oh, isn't that neat? The activity of God's love in our behalf is Jesus. Jesus is the love of God expressed in our behalf. Wow. Jesus is the heart of God made known. One of my favorite verses is John 1.18. It, it describes the very bosom of God. And my translation of it is something goes something like this. That God is so filled with, oh God, in the, in the moment of his very expression of his nature, literally reached down inside of his bosom, grabbed a hold of the very heart of his very being, yanked out his bosom, his seat of affection, how he feels inside, what drives him, what moves him. And he dumped it on the street and we have seen the insides of God running around and his name is Jesus. Jesus is the insides of God expressed. The love of God. God acted in your behalf. Well, does God love me? Does he not love me? Does he act in my behalf or does he not act in my behalf? Jesus settled that issue. You no longer can ask that question. For Jesus is God's love action in behalf of you. God sent his son. Now, let's back up to something we talked about in our previous class. When God sent his son, he didn't send 
what he had. He sent what he is. And when God invited you to become a part of him, he did not invite you to become a part of what he has. He invited you to become a part of who he is. Who is he? Oh, he is love. Unconditional love. Love without strings attached. Love without any ifs. Love that doesn't say, if you will, I will love you. Love that just simply says, I love you. And it's not dependent upon you and who you are, but it's dependent upon me and who I am. And I've decided I'm going to love you and you can't stop me because it's the essence of my nature. It's who I am. That's what Jesus became for you. He gave up what he had. All the attributes of God that he had, he set aside. But the essence of who he is came to earth. And we saw the bare essentials of the nature and essence of the life of God displayed in our world. Do you know that's what our world is crying for in this hour? Oh, if they could see Jesus again. We are to be his body. We are to be filled with his nature. Oh, God, act in my behalf again. God is love. First ingredient, his love kicked him off his throne. And Jesus is the action of the love of God in our behalf. God's love acted. Let's look at the second ingredient. It's found in verse 11. Beloved, stop right there. Now I know that John was calling a group of people that he's writing to, beloved. He's playing the role of the grandfather, if you please, the old man who is looking upon his children, his spiritual children, and saying, oh, you are my beloved. It literally means object of my love. But see, this word that's used here in the Greek language for beloved is so powerful because it relates to the word that was used by the Israelites. In other words, the Israelites believed that they were the chosen of God, the favorite of God, the picked out ones of God, the special ones of God. They were the object of the love of God. They believed that. Then you come into the New Testament and you find that Paul and John, they just explode that thing. That yes, Israel, you are the beloved of God. You are the picked out ones. But wait a minute. God has done that for every individual. God has done that for me. I have become the object, the beloved of God. Can you grasp that? That you are the literal object of the love of God. God is love. It's the essence of his nature. But the love was so powerful, it kicked him off his throne. And Jesus acted in your behalf. God's love acted in your behalf. And it, it acted in behalf of you. You are the object. The full blaring essence, action of the love of God has come to you. You are the total object of the outpoured love of God. Phenomenal idea. You are the object of God's love. Uh, if my mother were here testifying, she would give a testimony that would go something like this. She would stand and say, I, just, I guess I'm just God's favorite. And of course, whenever she'd say that, I'd put an elbow in her ribs and say, move over. Don't you understand? I am God's favorite. God spends all of his time on me. God is all wrapped up in me. God is constantly surrounding me. God is constantly loving me. God is constantly engulfing me. God is constantly meeting my needs. His whole attention is constantly upon me. I am the object of the love of God. God and I have got something going. God and I are so tight and so special together. God and I, it's like we're all wrapped up in each other. Now, I know in my mind, I know, because I've read the Bible, I know that God feels that way about you. But in my own life, it feels like that I'm the only one. It feels like he's totally engulfed in me. It feels like I am the special selected object of the love of God. The old timers were right when they said, if you were the only one that needed to be saved, Jesus would have come and died for you. If you were the only one, he would have done that. Because you are the object of the love of God. And it's something about the love of God that is so concentrated that when you experience his love in your life, you get the feeling he loves you more than anybody else. And yet, again, I know that isn't true because I've read the Bible and I know he loves you. 
although I don't know why, but I know he loves you, but somehow, some way, in this whole dynamic of what's taking place, I have become the, the object of the outpoured love of God. Who he is has moved out in my behalf, and I have become the object of that love. What a great, overwhelming passage, story that has gripped us. Now, there's the next ingredient that I want you to move to. It's also found in verse 11. It says, Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. So what do we have? God is love. God's love acted. You're the object of his love. And now this third ingredient is response. God wants you to respond. But that shouldn't be hard. That should not be hard for us at all. Because we understand that in every realm of life. Love wants response. For instance, my wife will say, I love you. And I say, my, it's a beautiful day out today, isn't it? And she'll say, I love you. I say, man, where are we going to go to dinner? She'd say, I love you. I'd say, hey, uh, what's going on this evening? She'd say, I love you. What on earth is her problem? She wants me to respond with, I love you too. See, love wants response. We all understand that. That's not foreign to us. So God comes and says, Manly, I love you. What does he want? He wants response. Hey, I love you too, God. But as you look at the passage, that's not the response he's after. Now, this is going to be very difficult because it runs cross-grain to all of our training and all of the way we are. As you look at verse 11, you note he says, Beloved, if God so loved us, what should be the response? If God wants response to his love action, what should be the response? We also ought to love one another. Oh, good night. Now, that's, that's a clinker, isn't it? I mean, that's a, that's a mash thumb. I mean, forevermore. Who would want that? See, I don't understand that at all. God comes and says, I love you. And you know what he wants me to do? He wants me to turn to you and say to you, I love you. And I don't want to do that because I don't give a rip about you, never have. See, all I've ever wanted to do is love him. Loving him is what I want to do. But he says, loving him is all tied into something about you. Now, that's the strangest thing in life. Can you imagine? My wife says, I love you, and I lean out the doorway and yell at the next door neighbor's wife, I love you over there. And my wife says, yes, that's what I wanted. That's the stupidest thing I ever heard of. See, that doesn't make any sense. See, I understand God coming and saying, I love you, and then on Sunday morning I raise my hand and sing, oh, how I love Jesus, and I get tickles up and down my spine, and I just express my love to God, and oh, you're so great, God, and oh, I thank you, God, and oh, and God sits up in heaven and says, ooh, I really, oh, I really like that. Hey, do it again, will you? I just, oh, that really turns me on. But that isn't what's going on in the scripture. What's going on in the scripture is God comes and says, I love you, and he wants me to turn and love my fellow man. Now, this is seen all over the scriptures. If this was just one little verse, hey, I would bypass it. I could adjust it. I could, I could make it say what I want to. But, hey, I can't take all the verses and make them say the way I want to. Hey, by the time you get done, you find out that there is a New Testament principle. Really important. That as you walk through the scriptures, there's this New Testament principle. And the New Testament principle is this, that God somehow, someway, has reached out and attached himself to my fellow man. And if I want to love God, I have to love my fellow man. In fact, how I feel about my fellow man is how I feel about God. And if I want to do something to God, I do it to my fellow man. In fact, the only way to do something to God is to do it to my fellow man. And it's all wrapped up in this essence of the being, which is the being love that he is. Really essential. Now, again, this is everywhere. This is everywhere. Uh, we talked about uh, the parables of Matthew chapter 25. And those parables are dynamic. The last parable was about the sheep and the goats. And you remember well 
Uh, Jesus comes in all of his glory, draws all the nations in, and divides the sheep right hand, goats left hand. And what's the division all about? I was, you did. I was, you did not. I was hungry, you fed me. I was hungry, you did not feed me. I was naked, you clothed me. I was naked, you didn't clothe me. I was, you did. I was, you did not. And they all looked at him and said, both sheep and goats looked at him and said, well, when were you ever like that? And Jesus explained, when you've done it to the least of these, you've done it to me. That somehow, some way, Jesus had attached himself to the least of these. And the way I treated thy fellow man is the way I treated Jesus. That is an awesome thought. In other words, the progression here is that somehow in the being concept, in the being love, in the very essence of the love of God coming and filling you, in the very nature of God possessing you, until love is not something you do, love is something you are, out of you begins to spill this response to that love. It's the same kind of response Jesus had. It's the same kind of response God the Father it demanded of God the Father. That the essence of who God is could not sit idly by and watch a world go to hell. The essence of who God is, he is love. He's being that. And that love drove him into this action. So this love action of redemption is always a response to God. Who he is. The love of the, the love, the being, who he is in his nature. Now if I ever get into that, if God ever gets into me like that, and I am being love, what's going to be the response? A response will be demanded. I am going to have to love others. It's going to be demanded of me. It's going to flow out of me. It's going to, I can't help it. And it won't be that I have to do that in order to be. It will be, oh, I'm doing that. I can't keep from doing that because I'm being. This is going to be the normal, natural response. So I can test myself of whether I'm being by, oh, is this the normal response of my life? Does this just naturally spill out of me? Is this just the way I am? It's just, this is the people uh, cross my pathway, and out of me spills this, oh, how can I help you? How can I involve, be involved? How can I lift you? How can I elevate you? What's going on? Am I, am I filled with the nature of God responding, responding to him? That's the dynamic of it. What a passage this is. Can we get in on that? Have we experienced the love of God like that? Is that what's taking place in our lives? Now, there are all kinds of scriptures about this, and I don't know that we've got time to go through them all, but there's just an abundance of scriptures that set up this basic principle. That basic principle of that when I'm filled with the love of God, when I'm filled with His nature, and I'm being love out of me, comes this response that is not natural without Him in its love for others. Now, the interesting thing about this is that if I were just doing something, if I were just in the doing mode, if that were the essence of things, then I would set up certain love activities that I would do to certain people. Well, you love me, so I will love you and do actions towards you of love. Therefore, I am okay. So I would do those things. But see, this being thing is takes us into a whole different realm because you can't possibly pull this off. There is no way to develop a list of love activities which will qualify for the being, the expression, the responding of the being. I've got to literally be filled with him and let it happen. And if I'm filled with him and out of me there begins to spill this, this dynamic action of his love, hey, the action, the doing will take care of itself. So this is about sourcing. This is what source sources you. And am I sourced by the nature of God? Response. So what have I got? God is love. His love kicked him off his throne and said, go do something about this, God. Couldn't idly sit by. I am the object of the action of God's love. Therefore, he's calling me to respond. Now, let's go to the next ingredient. It's verse 12. No one has seen God at any time. It's a key statement. No one has seen God in any time. So obviously, if God is going to be seen, he's going to have to be seen through me. So nobody's ever going to see the love of God unless it's seen through the expression of a man, a woman, a child. 
verse 12, no one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love has been perfected in us. Did you get the word perfected? This is perfected love, the quality of perfected love. Now, the word in some translations is completed. So it's the idea of completed love. So there's this idea that God's love is not complete. And immediately we would coil on that and say, whoa, wait a minute. God's love is not complete. How can you say that? Well, that's the dynamic of love. See, the young man bows the knee, uh, says to the young lady, I love you. Will you marry me? If she says yes, love is complete. If she says no, then love is left dangling. Now, God comes and says, I love you. What does he want me to do? He wants me to respond by loving others. And if I do not respond by loving others, then his love is left incomplete. So the loving of others is the completion of the love of God. Do you see the being concept in the middle of that? Here's this God who is love. Not what he does, it's who he is. And as this internal nature of the love of God boils and burns within him, it demanded an outside action. And God stepped out in redemption in our behalf, couldn't leave us alone. Now that we've experienced that, and we've become the love of God, he has filled us with his nature. We must respond by loving others. And if, we, if we're not responding in the activity of loving others, obviously, oh, we are, the love of God is being left incomplete. God is cut off. So my life is to be the completion of the flow of the love of God. And again, the focus is not on doing lovely activities. See, I might dig some of those up and do lovely things for certain people. But the kind of love that God has, which is a being love that flows from the depth, that knows no prejudices, that has broken down all the walls, that holds no grudges, that is the flow out, that doesn't look for something to be in return, but only looks for what it can give. That kind of agape love that says, how can I help you? How can I pour my life out for you? When I become that, when his nature indwells me, and I literally am being that, out of me flows this response thing to my world, and that is the completion of the love of God. God's love becomes complete. Wow. Now, you move into the next section. And the next uh, ingredient is, by this, verse 13, by this we know that we, get the words here, by this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he's given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father sent the Son as Savior of the world. Wow. Did you get the words? By this we know we abide in him and he in us because he's given us of his spirit. See, that's really tight. That's really close. That's really one. See, it's in the oneness. So now he brings us to the heart of the sandwich. And I don't know what you like on your sandwich. Uh, whatever you like. Tomato, ketchup, uh, lettuce, uh, cheese, whatever you want on your sandwich is okay with me. But hey, this is the meat of the sandwich. And this is not a slice of bologna. This is stacks and stacks and stacks of roast beef. This is the meat, the heart of the whole thing. And it's the ingredient of indwelt. The closeness of it. Well, it's impossible to love like that. I know. It's impossible to always respond like that. You're absolutely right. It's impossible to do lovely deeds towards every person. You're dead right. I mean, I can't treat everybody that way. You're exactly right. I can't help it if I've got prejudices. You're exactly right. I don't can't help it if some people hurt me and I can't respond in a loving way. I understand that. I can't control the way I feel inside. You're dead right on that. So I've got to be indwelt. He in me, and I in him. Listen to it again. By this we know that we abide in him, and he in us. How do we know that we abide in him, and he in us? Well, his love has been perfected in us. And what's the perfecting of his love? Oh, it's the response of loving others. So, the whole thing brings us back to the being idea. The whole concept here is that, oh, the God who is love, unconditional, without reservation, can't help himself. 
Love that's not determined by the other person. Love that's not determined by the object of the love. Love that is determined by the one who's, who is love. That nature, that nature has got to get inside of me. I've got to eat this roast beef. I've got to eat this sandwich and get him inside of me. I've got to literally let him be who he is in me so that out of me this response can take place. And when this response takes place like it took place in him, what was that response? Sent his son. The redemptive response, the response that, hey, while we were yet in our sins, Christ died for us. The redemptive response of unconditional love, when that takes place, when that love gets in me, when I am filled with that nature, out of me will come this response. And when that response takes place, I automatically know, oh, yes, yes, I see it now. I am filled with him. Yes, I am. I am one with him. He abides in me and I in him. See, that's the result. That's the response. That's what comes out of this. When Jesus lives in me like that, I must be indwelt with him. That becomes the heart of holiness itself. I must know him in that kind of intimacy. Indwelt. Oh. Does he live in you? Are you in him? Intimacy. Oneness. So what should I go after? Loving others? No. What should I go after? Discipline my life, learning how to bite my lip without taking any, needing a stitch? No. What should I do then? I should go after him. I should get into him. He should get into me. He is my one focus. He is the driving passion of my life. He is what, all that I need. I must get into him. Now, the next section of this, the next ingredient, what have we got so far? God is love. His love acted. Couldn't sit idly by, kicked him off his throne, said go do something about it. So his love acted. You're the object of his love. You're the object of his love? Yes, he has acted in your behalf. While we were yet in our sins, Christ died for us. Now he wants us to respond. Because we've been the object of his love, response is going to come out of us. The response is, I'm going to love others. Because he, his love is perfected in us. Because he's indwelt us with his very person. The being of God has come to be in us. Now the next ingredient is this. Listen to this. Verse 15. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. All of this has to do with Jesus. Listen to it. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. Wow, what a passage. It's all about Jesus. See, this all focuses on the person of Jesus. The confession of Jesus and abiding in Jesus and letting Jesus abide in you. So what do you have? God is love. His love kicked him off his throne. You're the object of his love. He wants you to respond by loving others so that his love can be completed in you because he indwells you through the person of Jesus. And then the last, which is the bread quality again, verse 16, because God is love. Wow, what a sandwich. Now, it would be easy to walk away from that, just wipe our hands, say, well, that's a nice study. God is love. Thank you, Jesus. But there's one more thing I want to call to your attention. My dad really taught me well. He said, after you've made this sandwich, there is a test of whether you've made it correctly. And the test is, when you eat this sandwich, you've got to put your elbows on the table, lean over the plate, because when you bite into this side, about half of it's going to come out the other side, and he called what came out the other side, drippings. So immediately when I looked at this as a sandwich, a love sandwich, I, wanted, I asked myself, I wonder if there are drippings. Oh, look at verse 17, the drippings. Love has been perfected among us in this. That we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. Now, often in the scriptures, there's what we call purpose clauses. They are most often introduced with a purpose word, like that or because. And in this verse, you have two of them. In other words, they make a great statement and then say, because or that and give the purpose of the statement. Now, look at verse 17. Love has been 
perfected or completed. Love has been completed among us in this. That, number one, we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Because, number two, as he is, so are we in this world. So he says, love has been perfected, completed, filled up. We have been filled with the character, the love, the nature, the being of God. For what reason? Number one, we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Can you picture the day of judgment? Everybody's outside of a great, huge building. There's no windows on the building. There's just one door. There's loudspeakers at each corner. And everybody's milling around, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people. And one by one, their name is being called, and they go in that end door, and they never come out. And everybody's scared to death. Oh, he's going to call me next. Oh, he's going to call me next. But not me. I'm not scared. I'm standing tall and saying, oh, I hope my name is next. I hope my name is next. Call my name. Call my name. And finally, he calls my name. And in big, great boldness, I stomp through the door. I go in. I look around. Hey, God, love your place. Man, this is great. Hey, wow, well, glad you called my name. Hey, I stomp right up. You're going to act like that on the day of judgment? Yeah. How can you act like that? Because his love has been completed in us. See, the completion of his love gives us boldness, no fear in the day of judgment. Anxious to see him. Why? Well, because we're filled with him. I mean, I mean, hey, he's come to indwell us because who he is, God is love. Who he is has literally filled us. And we've eaten of the sandwich. We've been indwelt by him. His nature is all, all, all over us. And we're responding out of his nature. And he's flowing through us. We're being in him. He abides in us. We abide in him. We can't help ourselves. It's all over us. We are filled with him. Wow, what a Jesus we have. Therefore, we have boldness in the day of judgment. Now, there's a second purpose clause. Because as he is, so are we. Now, that's our kind of language. Yeah, your teenager comes to you and says, well, I don't understand how this works, Dad. And you say, okay, let me explain it to you. Do you understand how this works? Well, yeah, I understand that. As this works this way, so this works this way. As so. That's what he's saying. As he is, referring to God. As he is, so are we in this world. How are we in this world? I don't understand how we're to be in this world. Well, he says that's easy. As he is, so are we. This is the way we are in the world because this is the way he is. And as he is, so we are. Well, how is, how is he? Oh, stick to the subject, stick to the passage. As you see it in the flow of the passage, how is he? God is love. So, he's not talking about omnipresence. Have you ever heard a preacher stand up and say, if you want to go to heaven, come and kneel at this altar and become omnipresent like God? Well, no. No, no preacher's ever said that, or at least shouldn't. I mean, we've not been invited to be omnipresent. That's what God has, and he's not said, I want you to have that too. He's never offered us that. God hasn't called us into what he has. He's not offered omnipresent to it. So if you've got your mind on being omnipresent, you just better bug off. And nobody's omnipresent by God. No angel is omnipresent. The devil isn't even omnipresent. Fast mover, but not omnipresent. So only God himself is omnipresent. So that's not what God has invited you to become a part of. Have you ever heard a preacher stand up and say, if you want to go to heaven, kneel at this altar of prayer and become omnipotent, all-powerful, like God. No, I've never heard that. Why? Because God has not invited us to become a part of what he has. He's invited us to become a part of who he is. Have you ever heard a preacher stand up and say, if you want to, be, if you want to go to heaven, come to this altar and become omniscient, all-knowing, like God? Obviously not. Nobody's all-knowing. God is the only one that's all-knowing. Angels aren't all-knowing. The devil isn't all-knowing. That's the fun of tricking him because he has, he's second-guessing you at best. So God has not invited us to become a part of what he has. He has called us to come become a part of who he is. So have you heard a preacher stand up and say, if you want to go to heaven, come and kneel at this altar and become holy like God is? Well, yes, I've heard that. Holy? Well, sure. What's this holiness business? Oh, it's love. 
God is love. It's all about love. It's the nature of God. It's the very essence, the being of God himself. And that's what he's invited me to become a part of. Friend, isn't that the most exciting thing you've ever heard in your life? That God hasn't offered you to become a part of what he has so he can watch you operate with it. God has literally slid himself down the middle and said, Hey, come on into my heart. Come on into my inner being. Come into what I am in the inside. Come, become a part of what, I, what, what my nature is. Let my very holy, loving nature fill you. And in the fullness of his nature, you will begin to be the expression of who he is in your world. God is love. How could you miss? God is love. Now, there's no way to pull that off in a doing sense. I cannot source that. I cannot bring that about. I cannot make that happen. The only chance I've got, he says, is that the God who is love must indwell me. I must become one with him. Who God is must become the very essence of my, uh, of my nature as well. I must know him in that kind of intimacy. And in embracing his, his nature, embracing his person, in embracing the very life of his being, out of me there begins to spill this aggressive kind of action of God. And it isn't the action that I can pull off. It is sourced by God because I am indwelt by the God who is love. Oh, that's the essence of it. Will I give my life to Jesus like that? Will I be indwelt by him like that? Will I let him fill me like that? Is that not the solution? It's not in the doing of lovely things. This is not in the development of loving characteristics. This is not in the development of loving, loving patterns. This is not in new, a new set of rules that will demonstrate love. This is about all. Oh, the nature of God who is love filling me and in the fullness of the nature of God I begin to be an expression of the very essence of who God is do you have that will you seek him for that Jesus we seek you and you alone we're not seeking solution to our problems we're not seeking that we would have more power in order to perform better. What we're after is you. Could you entwell us? Could your nature, could I be bathed in your nature? Could you overwhelm me? Could you encompass me? Could you engulf me with your very self? Please, Jesus, everything that is not of you, I rebuke it. I only want your nature, your being. Oh, I give up the right to do my own thing, to have my own being to express my own personhood. I want you to come and express your personhood through me. God is love. I embrace you today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.